Hey guys, like and subscribe for more content. Let's jump into this one. Hey guys, so this is going to be part two in our video. Part one was a simple itemized installation process on all things Linux as far as getting a Linux Mint system up to date, installing some software so you could really mimic a business experience in a, in a Linux Mint system versus having to upgrade to Windows 11. The first video really went over, you know, why you would do that. If you don't want to spend the money, you want some security, you want an OS that'll work, and you want to gain back some performance, this is the best option that you can do without spending any money. So I figure in this video, let's jump into a little bit of scripting. And then maybe on the last video, we'll jump into the removal processes. Like how do you remove applications? How do you remove software? How do you script remove stuff? Things of that nature. And then maybe in our last video, we'll do into customizations. Like how do we make this look a different way um, and customize the uh, UI layout? So in this video, I'm going to actually do a lot of comparison between Windows and Linux. And the reason why is because a lot of us come from a Windows background. And we want to know how to do these things in Linux. But when you go onto all these forums and you look at stuff, a lot of it's convoluted. A lot of it's downplaying, like you're supposed to know this um, somehow by just, you know, common knowledge. And the vast majority of us just don't because we didn't grow up in a situation where Linux was available or Unix was available. We grew up in a Windows house where people had a Windows computer or a Mac. But we didn't really grow up learning how to do command line things and setting scripts and using bash and things of that nature because we just didn't have those systems available to us. I would say our young generation today, the ones that are probably in their teens, maybe 13, 14 years old, they probably have multiple computers in their homes. But the people that are in their 20s, their 30s, and their 40s didn't. I mean, the vast majority of the people in their 40s and maybe even their 50s probably, if they were lucky, had one computer that that they had access to. And chances are it was a shared machine either at a school or at a resource location like a library, but it probably wasn't at home. Most people didn't really have home computers until you know the, the early 2000s. Maybe if you were lucky, you had a late 90s, like a Windows 95 or Windows 98 system. But really it wasn't until about 2001, 2002 that people really started to have home computers. So nobody really learned this stuff. And quite frankly, even if you did learn it, a lot of it's different now. Not all of it, but a lot of it is different. A lot of it's actually easier now than it was then. Okay, so let's talk about scripting. Now, you could use Vi or Vim for your scripting languages. Excuse me while I close this pop-up. You could use Vi or Vim for your scripting. Um, Vi, or, Vi is really just, it's a text editor. Um, it's done through Terminal. But again, since we're comparing Windows to this operating system, we're going to use the most Windows configured versions of the software to make these things happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit start and we're going to type in text, T-E-X-T. -E we're going to see the text editor and we're going to open that up. Okay, so once we have our text document open, what we're going to have to do is we have to create something called a shebang. And what that is, is it's a uh, application delimiter. So basically what it does in Linux is it says to run an application a certain way. Um, you know, when you look at Windows, you have like a batch file or a .bat file. Windows knows to translate the batch file into a command logic. So you don't have to add this stuff to it. But in Linux, you do have to add the, uh, the, the header, the leading line, to tell the application to run this shebang as a sh file or a bash file. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the bin forward slash slash uh, sh version. However, you could use PHP um, if you want running a PHP code or Perl for a Perl script. There's even a way to do a forward slash false, though I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of that is because what it does is it just throws an error and says that the application is a false and it's not to be run. So maybe it's customization that you could add to this to change one line to change the way an application flows through the text. I'm not entirely sure, but that's what we got to start with in this particular script. Now, something that I want to point out that's pretty important is that while we can't script the applications, there are certain prereqs that are required. So you will have to watch the first video in order to get those prereqs at minimum installed, which is you're going to need to know how to install the snap repository. And you're going to have to do the sudo app get update and upgrade uh, commands first with a reboot after you install the snap, as well as a reboot after you do the update and the initial upgrade. If not, what's going to happen is, is this script that we're going to configure here will fail because you won't have the needed repositories to install. Now, the reason why those things aren't included in this script is because we require a reboot in order to install them. 
after the script is done installing, if we want to install Steam, we have to do that as a separate install as well because Steam requires a reboot after the install. So if you do Steam in the middle of the package install, what's going to happen is you're going to end up in a situation where your network adapter is going to drop and you'll likely never get network access ever again. You'll have to go through a repair, uh, replacement, you're going to be missing files, you'll probably have to use another machine to download them to a thumb drive and copy them over. It becomes a big mess. And the reason why is because Steam replaces your network adapter drivers in Linux to allow you to communicate and connect to the Steam repository. Um, so don't do that. Make sure that you have all the updates installed. Make sure you install your packages and install Steam as the last thing you install. Okay, so what I did is I actually copied over a file over to the system. So I'm going to right click on this thing. I'm going to do open with text editor. And in this file is going to be our full build. This is everything that existed yesterday in our configuration. So all of the setups that we did on the previous video is in here. Uh, but it's just a script versus the actual install step-by-step -step that we did. Now, if you come from a Windows environment, you know Batch, this works the same, right? We're going to update, we're going to install the repositories. Now, the repositories in Linux, unlike Windows or somewhat like Windows, depending on how it's configured and what's available, we know that in Windows updates, we have the option for some Windows updates that are not Windows-based applications or Microsoft-based applications. These PPAs that are in here, these add the update availability to the update command. So when you run the update, it updates all the other applications too. So in other words, you could use a central repository to update all of your applications and the OS and not just the OS and then have to hunt and peck and find the configuration and update through the application. Now, obviously that's a lot easier on Linux than it is on Windows because Windows requires you to click on the application, choose the update, click on the application, choose the update, and hunt and peck over and over and over again through all the applications. But in Linux, you just add the repository and then you run this one single command and it updates everything all at once. The next thing in our script here is the wget, and this is gonna download these applications directly to the downloads location. And you'll notice the download location in this particular script is scripted as dot forward slash, which means that you have to have the command in the home folder. If you put it elsewhere, like in public, it'll download to the downloads Microsoft location under public. And then when it goes to execute it, it'll fail because it doesn't know that the public folder is the path. So for my script, at least, it's gotta be in the home directory. If you're gonna do it yourself, you could change the path. To wherever you want it to go so that way it downlo downloads it to the right location and then execute it from that location. Once it finishes downloading the stuff we're going to go over here we're going to update again make sure we update the repositories so that way we have all the latest versions and then we're going to go down here and we're going to do installations right so we're going to install the YouTube downloader we're going to install OBS studio we're going to install um, OpenShot we're going to install Microsoft Office's apps for Linux we're going to install the Chrome browser. We're going to install Zoom. And then we're going to go down here and we're going to install the Snaps. We're going to install Teams for Linux, Slack, VLC, and Discord. Then we're going to update and then we're going to upgrade. Now, what the upgrade does is it upgrades all of the packages. So if you download like 5.3.2, but the latest version is 6.0, it'll upgrade those to 6.0's version. It will also upgrade the OS to the latest kernel build and everything else. Now there are additional commands you could run if, for instance, your kernel up does, update doesn't work correctly or if um, you know, uh, your distribution or uh, uh, distro list isn't completely updated, it'll update that and then it'll update, upgrade the system. So there are, are additional commands you could run if there's a problem, but this is a fresh build, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, and then it's gonna clean. So the cleanup is to clean up all the cache on the system, right? Because we don't want to retain all the stuff we download in the downloads directory and all the updated uh, stuff. We don't want to retain all the old stuff. It's not a really a necessary to do that. Um, and then we're going to remove the actual packages. So we'll remove like uh, the dev files that exist in the downloads directory that we don't need anymore. And that's basically in a Windows environment. Like if you click on download in Google Chrome and it goes to the download location, after you install it, there's really no reason to retain version three because version 3.2 may come out the following week. So why are you gonna retain the older version? So you just delete those, right? Um, and then we're gonna reboot the system. In the script, which this will be inside of the um, wiki, uh, you'll see things that are 
hashed out. Now hashed out values are things that you could just set, you know, what this does. So this doesn't actually get run or executed, just the actual commands get run. So if you decide, all right, you know what, I don't want the YouTube downloader. You could actually add a hash and a space and now that won't install. It'll skip it. So there's a way to customize this that you can install like half and then another half and then do whatever you want. But for the sake of this, try to make it as easy as possible. It's just really a playbook. It starts at the beginning, runs through all these commands, and then it reboots itself. So let's uh, jump over into the terminal. I'll show you how to actually execute the command. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to open the terminal. Now, if you want to see if we're in the right place, what we're going to do is we're going to type in ls and hit enter. And you'll see that we have an application install sh and an application removal sh. And then we'll have the folders that are listed in blue. Now, if you write dir like in Windows, you can still see this stuff. But it doesn't differentiate between a command and an actual folder. That's really the only difference between the two, dir and ls. So for the sake of Linux, I just use lx ls, but in Windows I would use dir, so if you're more comfortable with dir, knock yourself off, uh, out. It doesn't really make any difference. So in Windows it's cls to clear things, but in Linux it's just clear. So if we hit enter, we go back to the default location or back to a clean screen. So now we want to actually execute this. Now since this is a bash script, we're just going to type in bash, b-a-s-h. We're going to do space, and we're going to type in a P, right, for application, and I'm going to hit tab, and we're going to see that application occurs, but it doesn't show the next part of the application name, and the reason why is because I have an application install and application removal, so if I do I and I hit tab, it'll finish out the command as application install.sh, and now I'm just going to hit enter on the keyboard, and when I'm prompted, I have to put my password in. So once you have your password entered, what you'll do is you'll just hit the enter key on your keyboard, and the system will execute the script and run through the installation and install all the stuff we did yesterday one by one in one continuous script. Now the bonus to doing it this way versus doing it uh, on a line by line basis is you could save this SH file to a drive, a thumb drive, an external hard drive, whatever it is, and then execute it on the machine again in a couple months if you need to reinstall or if you have a problem. Um, it gives you the ability to retain whatever it is that you had installed as your previous build. Now in Windows, anybody that's an admin out there can tell you that it doesn't work like this. If you want to do a build, you'd either have to build out the ISO, you would have to build out um, something in SCCM, um, you could build a customization for packages, you could use the paid version of Chocolatey, you could use the um, configuration for um, Oh God, there's so many. Uh, Case is one of them. It used to be Quest, or I think it's Quest now. It used to be Dell, um, which is a, uh, a build, a store to build out uh, for your installation for your clients. So you can create standardization. Um, yeah, in Linux, it's just a file. Just create the file and then you're good to go. You can download and install the application. So I'll let this run and then we'll jump back into the video after this thing's done. Okay guys, so we just came back up. Let's take a look real quick and see what we have installed. So we click on start, we're going to see under internet, we have Chrome installed, we have Discord installed, we have Slack, we have Teams, we have Zoom. If we go down here, we have Microsoft Office uh, online apps, so we could see Microsoft Outlook, OneDrive, OneNote, Excel, Word, PowerPoint. Um, we have OpenShot, we have OBS Studios, we have VLC Player. So we could see that our script completed successfully without error. Now, obviously, you guys could create more complexity inside of your scripts as you go. Um, that's up to you. That's an option. If you're just watching this because you want the builds, then obviously you could just grab that right off the wiki. You wouldn't really even have to watch these videos, but uh, that's something you could check periodically. I may add more to this script as I go for customizations or add custom scripts in there. Um, but for the sake of this, I, I really decided that this was probably the easier way to go. If you want to build yourself a Linux Mint system to replace your Windows 11 upgrade requirements, um, again, because Windows 11, uh, October, I think, 2025, it was pushed. It was originally April of 2025 was the end of life for Windows 10. But Microsoft pushed it to October 2025. And who knows, they may push it again. They're not doing so well with selling Windows 11. People are not adopting it at the speed they were hoping. I mean, if 
publicly referring it uh, to Windows 11 as Windows ME 2.0 for the past year now to clients who want to upgrade and honestly suggest to them just paying the ransom fee that Microsoft is going to charge to do the extended support um, for a couple months or years just because, forget it, Windows 11's junk. Um, or even to use a WSUS server and pay for the upgrade, the um, support for the extended support update package and use WSUS to push the updates to Windows 10, just to retain 10 for as long as possible. Because again, Windows 11 is really, really bad. And I know a lot of people say, oh, I haven't had any problems with it. Uh, that's great. I'm telling you from somebody that works in the field, it's god awful. It's slow, it's heavy, it's bloated, it's spying, it's junk. You click on things, they don't appear. You get blue screen of death issues, you get random things disappearing. You can't disable drivers. Even with driver updates disabled through the registry, they added additional registry locations, so you gotta change those too. It's a mess. It's really, it's thrown together. It's not well thought out. And it's possible it could get better. Um, who knows, two, three years down the line, it might actually be as good as Windows 10 was. But it's not there yet, and people are not adopting it. So right now, I'll tell you, October 2025 looks like the end for Windows 10. But who knows if that will actually come into play or if Microsoft will keep supporting Windows 10 for another year while they fix Windows 11. Okay, so now that we have our script done or completed, right? We have all our applications installed. If we want to install Steam, we have to grab this right here. And we'll copy this. We'll go into our command line here, into our terminal. And we'll literally just right click and do paste and then hit enter so we could upgrade or install rather Steam. Um, so let's do that real quick. Okay, so I'm just gonna click on enter on the keyboard. And there it goes. So now it's going to install Steam. So once this finishes, we should have the Steam package installed and ready to go. So keep in mind with Steam, it's a two part, right? So we're going to download it first to the system. And that's just the installation portion. Um, that's going to include additional drivers for a network adapter as well as for our video card. Um, once that's finished, what it's going to do is it's going to give us the ability to actually install the Steam GUI, the application itself, on it, which we'll find inside of the Start menu. Okay, so once that finishes, we're going to do uh, Reboot. So we'll do sudo reboot now and hit Enter. Okay, so the system rebooted and came back up. And on Reboot, we're going to actually go in here and we're going to take a look to see specifically what we got going on. So if we go into Internet, we're going to see Install Steam now as an option. And if I click on this, this would install Steam. However, I'm not gonna click on it. And the reason why is because I just don't have the drive space. So Steam on Linux is enormous. Um, I wanna say it's probably eight gigs, 10 gigs in size just to install the application. So keep that in mind if you have a low performing hard drive or not too much hard drive space, you don't necessarily wanna install that because it's gonna be big. The other thing you wanna do is before you run the Steam install, which I didn't show in this video, but before you run it, you wanna make sure you have all of the updates done. You have your kernel updates, you wanna have to make sure you have uh, your updates in your package, your upgrades in your package. Make sure everything is up to date before you actually install the Steam application. Otherwise, you can run into issues with drivers, um, which you really don't wanna run into issues with drivers on Linux. It's, it's not fun to recover from them. It sucks on Windows, it's worse on Linux. So. That's something to just keep in mind is that if you're going to install Steam, make sure you have every single update done on the system before you install it. All right, guys, so that's how to install stuff with a script. That's how to write a basic script using Bash uh, and the Shebang configuration inside of a, um, a text document. How you have to save the text document, how things work, and where this will exist, which is in the wiki um, once you guys decide to look. Check out the uh, following up videos here, which should come out in the next couple days, which is gonna be how to do a removal of the applications, how to remove stuff, how to uninstall things. Um, we're also gonna go over how to customize this, how to change the theme, make it look different ways. Um, definitely like and subscribe if you haven't already, and thanks for watching, guys.